ever stop to think about the Christian concept of the cross? It's one of those things, you know, might seem kind of heavy at first, but honestly, there's so much to unpack there. Yeah, it's funny how people react to the cross. Some folks that just don't get it, think it's too simple. Others, totally baffled by it. But we're going deeper today, beyond those surface level reactions. I'm gonna dig into why it's so central to Christianity. We're lucky to have Kim Keller's The Reason for God as our guide, right? mm -hmm. specifically chapter 12, where he really digs into some of the tough questions about faith, like why is Jesus's death on the cross seen as this positive thing as good news. It's mind-blowing when you think about it, the different ways people have always reacted to this idea. Like Kella talks about with Gandhi and Malcolm Muggeridge, two totally different responses. Totally. Okay, set the stage for us. Two different perspectives, two different guys. Gandhi, he really admired Jesus, you know, the selflessness, standing up for what's right, all that. But the cross, that he just couldn't wrap his head around. He saw the sacrifice, but the divine part, it just wasn't clicking for him. Then you have Muggeridge, the journalist, who was skeptical for a good chunk of his life. Yeah. But Keller talks about how even the idea of the cross would stop Muggeridge in his tracks. Like it shook him up. You know, he knew there was something huge E there. So we have two brilliant minds, two completely different reactions to the cross. Makes you wonder, what is it about the cross that triggers such different reactions? Even today, why did Jesus have to die? That's what we're getting into today. Exactly. And Keller... He brings up a truth about forgiveness that I think gets missed a lot. It's never free. Whether it's between people, between God and us, it always, always comes at a price. I love that example he uses about the car. It's so relatable. Someone borrows your car, totals it. You've got a choice. Yeah. You make them pay for it. Right. Or you say, forget it, and basically eat the cost yourself. Forgive them. And that choice, that's where you see the cost of true forgiveness. It's not just saying, oh, no biggie. It's taking that weight, that burden onto yourself. And it's not always about the material stuff either, yeah. right? Emotional wounds, they work the same way. To really be there for someone who's hurting, to truly listen and support them, that takes something out of you. It's them or you, as Keller puts it. Real forgiveness, it requires this element of substitution willingly stepping into the other person's pain. Which brings us to, I think, a really powerful example of this kind of forgiveness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Keller mentions him earlier in the book, but Bonhoeffer's life and death, that's like the embodiment of this idea. Oh, absolutely. For anyone who doesn't know, Bonhoeffer was this German pastor, a theologian, and he actively resisted the Nazis. He was very outspoken, and it landed him in prison for his beliefs. He was actually executed just a few weeks before the end of World War II. This is what gets me. Even after going through something so horrific, you read Bonhoeffer's letters from prison, and they are full of forgiveness. No bitterness. He wrote about bearing the sins of others, choosing love over hate, even when he was staring evil in the face. And that says so much, doesn't it, about the power of forgiveness. Even in a place like that, facing death, Bonhoeffer, he still believed that true forgiveness, the kind that cost him everything, it's the only way to actually break free from evil. Man, Bonhoeffer's life, it's a lot to process. But it really makes you think, right, if human forgiveness, just between us, requires that level of sacrifice, that cost. Yeah. What does it take for God to forgive? And not just one person, but like everything, humanity's entire track record. It's huge, right? You said it. If we struggle with the cost of forgiveness, imagine the weight of all the wrong ever done. And that's what the cross is getting at, isn't it? It's God himself stepping in and shouldering that burden. So it's not like God's up there needing some kind of, I don't know, payment a blood sacrifice or something. It's not about making him less angry. It's more like... It's, it's about absorbing the cost. Remember what Keller said. It's them or you. And on the cross, God chooses you. He takes on our sin, our pain, all the brokenness. That's the cost of forgiveness. You know, I got to be honest. Even after all this, there's still that question that comes up. Why couldn't God just, I don't know, forgive? Why the violence, the suffering of the cross? Doesn't it seem counterintuitive? If God's all-powerful, why not just snap his fingers and make forgiveness happen? It's the question, isn't it? And Keller, he really digs into this. And his point is, true love, the kind that actually changes us, it's not just a feeling. It can't be. It demands something from us. It's an exchange. So it's less, hey, I love you from a distance, and more, I'm diving in with you, even if it's going to cost me something. Exactly. Keller uses those examples, remember, putting yourself at risk to help someone who's in danger. Or what about parents? The sacrifices they make for their kids all the time, the yeah. energy, everything they pour in, all for someone else. And the thing is, it always means giving something of yourself, even when you lose something in the process. It's like love has its own kind of math. 
you know, the giving actually matters. And that's what's so radical about Christianity. On the cross, God's not off somewhere else, offering forgiveness from a distance. He's right there in it with us, experiencing our pain, feeling what it means to be human. So the cross isn't saying, hey, suffering is great, just accept it. It's God himself, identifying with those who suffer, with the hurt, the overlooked, the people the world pushes aside. It's like he's flipping the script on how we see power. It's the great reversal, just like Keller calls it. Jesus suffered for us, yeah, fulfilling this need for justice, but he also suffered with us. He took on the weight of our pain, and that changes everything. It's like someone hit the reset button on how we're supposed to view the whole world. Suddenly, strength isn't about being in charge. It's about serving, about sacrifice, and the stuff we chase after money, status. It all seems kind of meaningless next to love and justice. It really does. All that stuff the world values, it fades away, you know. But true fulfillment, I think that comes when we say yes to something bigger than ourselves. At least that's the idea, right? It really makes you think twice, huh? About what we put value on. All that striving for power, for status. I mean, maybe it's not the whole story. It makes you wonder, yeah. Like, what lasts? What really matters at the end of the day? It's like Keller saying, maybe it's about letting go of control, admitting we need something bigger than ourselves. Maybe that's where we find real freedom. And that's where I think stories, you know, even fictional ones, they tap into something powerful. Keller talks about this, right? Movies like Angels with Dirty Faces, A Tale of Two Cities, those classic stories of sacrifice, someone laying down their life for another. Man, they just hit differently. They get you right here, don't they? In the heart. Because we recognize that kind of love, that kind of cost. It's real. But here's the thing about the cross. It's not just a story. It's the story. Humanity's story. And we're all a part of it, you and me. That's what makes it so personal, I think. It's not some far-off event, some theoretical sacrifice. This was for us. Jesus, he entered into our mess, took all the junk we'd ever done wrong, so that we could be known, really known, and loved, just as we are. That's what gets me every time about Keller's writing. He's not afraid to dig into those theological ideas, but he never lets you forget. This is hard stuff. It's one thing to understand it in your head, but to let it really sink in, to let it change you, that's something else. It has to become real. And he ends the chapter talking about how the cross speaks to those two big things we wrestle with, you know, pride and fear. Pride, because we like to think we're self-sufficient, that we don't need this kind of radical grace. And then fear, because deep down, I think everyone wants to be fully known, fully loved. Mm. But what if it costs us something? It's like this paradox, isn't it? The cross. It's in the surrender, the admitting we need help, that we actually find freedom, real life. Maybe, just maybe, this symbol, this thing that's tripped so many people up, Maybe it's actually the key to a whole new way of being human, of loving, of living. That's definitely something to chew on, something I know I'll be thinking about long after this deep dive. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. We'll catch you next time.